All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Susan Madsen, who is in Utah. How are you doing, Susan? Doing great. Yeah, and Susan is considered one of the world's top global thought leaders on the topic of women and leadership. Her research has been featured in, in News and World Report, Atlanta New York Times, Parenting Magazines, uh, and, and many other. And, you, and also you have a very, very impressive array of books that you have written. And I believe you have a couple of new ones coming out soon. Is that right? Yeah, I, I do. I've done a lot of scholarly books, uh, edited books, and, and original research on, on the lifetime journeys of top women leaders in the world, um, and then have a few books coming out really geared towards how do you prepare to lead specifically for teenagers and young adult mm -hmm. women. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's, fun. that's fantastic. I'm sure that's fulfilling uh, a void that's probably been there, especially for that age group. So um, get, getting into it, uh, Susan, so women in leadership, and you said, um, you know, you've, you've worked and talked and coached a lot of um, women through their leadership journey. What is What are some of the ways that a, a woman's leadership journey would be different, say, from a man's? Oh, the journey in and of itself is very different. It, uh, John, it starts when you're born, actually, because you're socialized so differently. And, and, and I've had people say to me, I raised my daughters and sons exactly the same. Yet we know from the research that when you raise, you know, just in home environments, there's a difference between boys and girls uh, in terms of, of confidence, in terms of even the chores. I mean, the research for decades has shown that generally speaking, boys are paid for their choice, chores that they do and girls are not. And so girls grow up thinking, well, I need to serve, I need to do that. And then 20 years later, they, they, they are nervous about negotiation and then they're trained to negotiate, then they negotiate and their bosses, men and women say, wait, they're thinking, why is she asking for money? That's, that's not you know, uh, what, what you should do. So, so all the way up, um, really, there's some differences. And, the, and if we're not really aware of those, then, then we just go through, you know, our journeys in different ways uh, to become leaders um, without oftentimes even thinking we should lean in and mm -hmm. step forward. Also, of course, of course, what we know about the journeys Often women do take some career breaks um, and they're not yeah. socialized to want to lead as much as men. I mean, what we know from the research is that boys are socialized much more often to see themselves as future leaders than girls are. And so you get to women in the workplace and they're not even thinking about going down those paths of leadership. Um, but I've interviewed 10 of the women governors in the United States top university presidents, people around the world in different roles. And it's so fascinating to see the differences, but the similarities and, and you know, in their journeys. And yeah. uh, it's it, most of almost, I would say of everybody I'm interviewed through the last 15 years, maybe just one was different. And that is most of them said, never planned to be a leader, never thought I would, just happened like when they were in that vice president level or mm. or whatever that below then they all of a sudden they thought ah maybe i could um yeah. so very very different yeah no that's 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 fascinating well at least i can give a shout out to my parents god rest their souls that uh, there were five kids three girls and three boys uh, three girls and two boys and they treated us all equally because none of us got paid for chores. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, things are changing. Kids these days yeah, really of course, do want to be paid. No, no, I, I, I know. But we do a lot of things um, that are just unconscious. And so when it was one of the mayors here in Utah, he said to me, like last year, I raised my daughters and sons exactly the same. And I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> and he said it again. And I said, no, you don't. I mean, it's so unconscious. And, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you've studied or your listeners, you know, studied unconscious bias training. I do some of that, but so much, most of what we do in life is really 
below the surface. We're not quite aware. Yeah. So uh, have you come across this? Because uh, I, I had a conversation with somebody else a while back, and, and one of the phenomena is um, maybe a little bit one of the difference between, you know, men and women. It's like, as you said, going for a leadership position, like some men may look at it and say, OK, there's 10 criteria here on the list. Yeah, Ooh, looks looks like I, I I have one and maybe two. I'm going to apply. No. Whereas, whereas, uh, whereas women would go, oh, uh, you know, I only have seven of them, I can't apply. Yeah, yeah, the research is, is quite clear with numerous studies now that about if men have about 50 to 60% of the qualifications for a promotion, for applying yeah. for a job, for running for public office, for, you know, any of those things, they'll say good enough. And it's, and then for women, you know, some of them say 100%, I say 90 to 100%. We're really socialized more towards, we've got to be perfect. And when you look into the data and the, the research on perfectionism, women really are more perfectionistic than men. Some men can be perfectionists, but perfectionism is actually not a great thing. I no. mean, people kind of brag about it, but what happens is if you're too perfectionistic, then you just don't get to action. You don't get more confidence because you don't try. You don't get it out there. And so the combination of things, and much of it is socialization. There are some genetics involved that we talk about sometimes. You know, men have much more testosterone and, and women estrogen and the, and the neurotransmitters are a little different. But a lot of it is really socialization, not just in your home, but your teachers, your coaches, your you know, all the way up, of yeah. course. Um, yeah. And, and no, that 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 insight about perfectionism, though, is is a, is an important one because you're right. I mean, some people do celebrate it, but I think perfectionism is often, uh, in some ways, it's a security blanket too. Because yeah. if if you're if you're striving for perfection, you're never going to achieve it. Therefore, you to your point, you never have to deliver anything. You never have to actually put yourself out there. And and when you look at the research on confidence. Confidence, actually, you get more confidence and confidence you can only get by acting. Self-esteem is different. Self-concept mm -hmm. is different. Confidence, you can't do it unless you try. And so the research says that actually the more you're okay with failure, the more confidence you'll actually gain because you try and you move forward and you fail, but then you're resilient and you move forward. So, so back to the growing up stuff, uh, what we know from the research as well in the elementary school, like studying says girls are just socialized to be good, to raise their hand, don't talk out of turn. And boys actually eight times more criticism they receive in elementary school than <laughs> girls. Yet 20 years and girls get praise. Then they are, then they are socialized to Praise, praise, praise is the most important. So flip forward 20 years in the workplace, men throw out ideas, they get hit down. They're like, okay. And women are just a little nervous about that They just, because they want everybody to, you know, those are some socialization. What, um, what's really great is that I, I've done a lot of research and I have six brothers actually, and I played sports growing up. And actually, you see some things with sport, playing sports, with speech and debate in high school, those kinds of things where you're, you're give and take, you lose, you win, you, you know how to do those. So you see some different dynamics. In fact, the research uh, a, a few years ago on women CEOs, top women, Fortune mm -hmm. 1000 CEOs, uh, like 89 to 92% of the women in those spots were athletes. Yeah, I could say in that. In high school and college, isn't that interesting? But, but of course, how do we make sure all of our girls and young women and boys and men, you know, young men too, we, 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 I do all my work. We, I don't lift women and have men, yeah. you know, I just don't do that. It's like, we need to lift everybody. And when men like you, John, if you lift women and girls and women, that doesn't take away from you that it's not a zero sum. You yeah. can lift uh, people of color and women and be lifted yourself. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, that, that makes that makes absolute sense. And I think it all it also comes down to that, you know, abundant mindset is like, you know, if you have an abundant mindset, 
you you can you can raise everybody up because there's a there's plenty for everybody and everybody everybody wins and that's a, our motto these days like winning together yeah um so I, I totally agree with that what are some what are some of the characteristics or 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 strengths that women bring to leadership that maybe is underappreciated that's a great question so you know even though a lot of people don't talk about styles as much and i don't love that you know, what we do see, though, is is women definitely naturally, not every woman, though. So when you yeah. when you don't do this as a woman, sometimes you get uh, really some criticism. But uh, women typically, you know, ask, you know, are more collaborative, uh, do teamwork, uh, really look at the development of of their people uh figured out ways to to link them forward giving them opportunities mentoring in some different ways um but but again um i've seen men some men do that men typically women typically do that more often not every woman but i've seen men that do that and and actually and even in the last 10 years john you see that collaboration you see that that's becoming more of a norm. I don't know if you've read the book, Athena Doctrine, um, but mm -hmm. it is a book that written by men, white men nonetheless, uh, but a, a global thing on feminine characteristics and, and masculine, even in the words. And they had uh, 64,000 people from different countries answer. And basically what they came down with is, is, and this was probably six, seven years ago it was published, but 66% of the sample, more women than men, said, actually, if men led more like women, you know, it would be actually, that's what we need in society moving forward. And I think that shift is happening. And men can do that really well as well. But women do bring um, this collaborative spirit uh, and, and compassion and empathy a little bit more than men because women you can argue against it but there's when you get down to the genetics and socialization you know it it, it is there and it leadership can look different for men and women um and women just need to be able to lead in the ways that and you see some of the top women leaders of countries right you saw that early pandemic how they kind of took charge and and did things a bit differently than the men but um you know, it's it's trying to to let us be authentic, women, men, whoever, you know. Um, yeah, in and ways. I think that's a. I, I just written that down because I think authentic is a really key part. I mean, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman in leadership, authentic authenticity is really key. Uh, but how often then do you think that? maybe when women do get into a leadership position, some women that they feel like they need to act a certain way or they need to be more like male leaders and maybe they move a little bit away from their authentic self as opposed to embracing it. It's, that's an interesting question. I get asked that quite a bit. You know, in the day, let's just call it, all women early on in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s really had to do that. They dressed more like men. They really had to do that, even, even into the 90s. I think the 2000s are like when it started really saying, wait, there's better ways to lead than this more um, older style masculine, which is the great man theory. I'm a leadership professor, right? Someone just telling you what to do and, and all of this, you see that still in organizations today, well, governments and organizations today. Um, but, you know, I, I think things are shifting and people are acknowledging that. And today, really, if you are as women trying to really be more masculine, that real for most, some people might be able to fake it, but for most, that's going to come across as not authentic. And because it's just not natural, it's it's so I think more and more. It, in most areas, but when you get into the STEM engineering, you know, some of those fields, there's still some interesting dynamics. Um, recently, I was just talking to a woman that's kind of climbing and she like started uh, swearing more. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's, she's like, <laughs> I'm trying to fit in. And I'm like, well, something in that culture needs to change because yeah. if you have to start bad habits to fit in, then something's wrong. Does that make sense? 
yeah. yeah, no, that made that made that makes complete sense. Complete sense to me because yeah, that's go- that's going to be inauthentic uh, to begin with. And second off, there's a great opportunity to start to change the culture. Yeah, yeah, culture change is hard though, as you know. But uh, and and oftentimes, and and unless you get the the tipping the critical mass, which tends to be from the research, thirty percent. Like if a board of directors have at least thirty percent women and some research says three, at least three women, then you see things really shifting in, in better ways. But in really strong STEM areas where there's really a shortage of women, um, you really have to get enough to, to say, wait, the culture we're bringing is the right culture. Yours might be okay, but ours is too. And let's figure out how to make this environment uh, really uh, a culture that everybody can thrive. And those same things, not just for gender, yeah. apply to race and LGBTQ and you know, d- dis- disabilities, all of that, you know, each are different, but there's some common principles with respect, you know, to, to everyone so that people can thrive better. Uh, absolutely. And, and just uh, before we finish, uh, just a, a couple of examples, you have to name the people, but a couple of examples of, you know, the women that you're talking about, the top leaders, what are some of the, what are some of the things that they have uniquely brought to the table and, and people have stood up and gone, wow, that's, that's, that's different. So one of the things that, that I just happened to talk about in um, a speech I did earlier this morning was uh, oftentimes uh, when you, I used to teach business ethics, right? So there's this ethical side. And what we know is that not every woman, not every man is the same, but generally women leaders are a bit more ethical, bottom line. Um, uh, One funny thing from one study though is is that if women do embezzle, at least they take less money. (laughs) (laughs) That's something to brag about. But but my point with that is that often, uh, especially women with strong voices that come in, will call out some ethical beha- unethical behaviors, really look into changing the culture. Some of that comes with a glass cliff. I don't know if you know what that term means, no. but yeah, there's a glass ceiling, but a glass cliff. Sometimes women are brought in when things are in crisis to fix, which means there's more of a chance that they will you know, fail, yeah. but they're brought in at the last minute. But uh, oftentimes companies will bring in a woman if there's been a really ethical issue, unethical, I should say, but an ethical complex issue to do that. So women tend to bring that again, like I said before, really uh, an environment of more of collaboration. One of the things often, not every woman, but often women will really help implement um, diversity inclusion you know, equity uh, types of things and let, they're more aware of, wait, unconscious bias. Okay, I'm gonna, not, I'm gonna bring that to consciousness and I'm gonna really, really look for the best person, but they'll be more aware that that best person could be a woman and mm-hmm. give women more chances um, and could be a person of color, could be, you know, all of those things. Um, So there's many, many things that women bring to the table. What we do know is that when women are the leaders are in that top leadership team, along with men, that you get the best results in terms of innovation and creativity and and the collective intelligence and, you know, all of those things. The diversity case is quite strong. Yeah, no, I I would have to agree with that. There was uh, one company I ran a number of years back, uh, my executive team, it was it was either half and half or it was even more leaning towards women. But I would say absolutely the dynamic of, of our meetings, the dynamic of our interactions. Yeah, it's so much richer, to be honest. Yeah. There's a lot of research to support that. And you know, I, th- I don't think it's going to go away um, moving forward. Mm-hmm. I mean, things have shifted to the point that, that it's expected, I think, now that, that governors and and the U.S. president will will consider having women on the ticket, you know, mm-hmm. as lieutenant governors or or whatever. And more women are just stepping forward to do things, and and more more energy. Even white men are, are male allies and and thinking more about what they can do to better support everybody. There's still, I have to say, a long ways 
we have a long ways to go. Uh, but when you start seeing that needle start to move at least, it gives you hope that, that we really can produce a good environments in companies, in our communities, in, in our US states or countries or regions uh, that really do help all people thrive, not just certain people that tend to look uh, you know, uh, at, you know, look like what the company has been or the environment has been led by in years past. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, that's a great point. Uh, and listen, fantastic insights. This is a fascinating Thank subject. Um, all of uh, Professor Susan's information will be below this video and, and links, etc. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, thank you. So I've been a lead leadership professor for many years. Um, and I just shifted to a new university. So I am, uh, my official title is the Karen Hayden Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. So that's a, big, a that's a time. That's a big, that big is. business card. <laughs> is that a placard? It is. I also do a lot of work. I started 12 years ago, what I call the Utah Women in Leadership Project for the state of Utah, which we do tons of research and resources and events and actually, we have great events that people from outside of Utah join um, with, with national leaders on this or that on, on Zoom. Uh, we have one coming up on with Sally Heligan. Hel oh man, I can't remember how to say her last name. She, um, oh, you better cut that part out. We have, <laughs> I'll, I'll back up. So <laughs> I can't remember now. So we have lots of events that uh, people can join us, even if they're not in Utah. And we do some research as well for, for people outside the state. But those are some things I do. I do teach classes. I do uh, work with the state government on efforts around inclusion and equity. And so I keep pretty busy, and I, and, but I love the work that I do and, and, um, and love you know working with companies and governments and, and even writing. Writing is hard though. So uh -huh. yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah, uh, Sally Helgeson, I think, is who you talk yes. about. Because I actually, because I knew I recognized the name because actually I've interviewed her here before. Yes, she's great, and I, yeah. I, I got contact. <laughs> anyway, she she will be joining us in a couple of uh, weeks, uh, talking about her latest book, how, you know, how women rise. So. Great. That's fantastic. Well, small world. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, listen, thanks again. My name is John Golden. Thank you all for watching and listening, and I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.